course, we will never reveal that until they are at the uh, uh, event. Uh, we have a huge contingent of the Dallas Master Naturalists. The Master Gardeners are going to be there. Uh, big group from Earth X. We're going to have a wonderful, we're expecting a full house on Thursday night, Dallas Arboretum. We do have some tickets left over. And uh, they are $35 in advance, $45 at the door. You not only get the awards dinner, but we have a full buffet by Jill for catering. It better be good because they're really, really expensive. I didn't say that now. But they, they do a great job of a full buffet. But the entertainment this year, we always try to outdo ourselves. But the entertainment this year is a group called Montopolis. Montopolis is a group out of Austin. It is basically a small orchestra, and they use original music. Their leader, Justin Sherborne, is a composer, actually writes the music, and the name of their program is The Legend of Big Ben. And they have a video, a wonderful video and audio that goes on while the orchestra plays. It's going to be a wonderful night. We still have tickets. And I just happen to have flyers here, if anybody might be interested in it, but especially if you're thinking about moving into the environmental community, this is, this is where we will all be. We will all be there on Thursday night, and you get to meet other people with different groups, different focuses, but your Dallas Sierra Club, the last count is we will have 40 people from our club there. So it's going to be, and thank you so much. Thank you. Have them come see me. I'll be in the back, I'll be in the front, and also before I forget, thank you everybody that brought the food. Our uh, our potluck approach it seems to be working. So that's all I got to say, Mr. Chair. Okay, before I forget, how many of you are visiting us for the first time tonight? Where are those forms? <laughs> we have these forms up here you fill out. You get our you can get our e-newsletter for free every month, tell you what's going on. We have none up here, but hey. We do. Oh, he's got the bunch of them right there. You give us those back. Okay. <laughs> What? How about if, if uh, you call them up there? Okay. 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 And uh, also, before I forget, after this meeting adjourns, we, a lot of us will go over to the Blue Goose and uh, eat over there and drink and commiserate. I mean, communi <laughs> communicate. I meant. Okay, so I think what we'll do now is go into our committee reports, brief committee reports before we do the program. So we're going to start with the Conservation Committee, uh, chaired by the Gouldies. Okay, uh, I am going to pass around the uh, these clipboards that have some of my conservation information on it. Uh, and in addition, the second page, a reuse paper. So ignore the backs of the pages. But on the second page, uh, you can put your name, clearly print your email address if you would like to get any of our emails. And we have uh, something added on here. Uh, next Tuesday night at the Angelica in Dallas at 7 o'clock, there will be a showing of Dark Waters, uh, which is uh, about uh, someone who got caught up in a conservation issue. Uh, it's rather a dramatic uh, film, and uh, we have free tickets available if you go to a special link, and if they don't run out of them. But 
none of us has the link right now. So if you want, I do. Oh, you do? Yes. Yeah. Now you tell us. Okay. If you if you check off on this list, uh, we will email that link to you. Uh, is it a short enough link that we can say? No, I don't want one. But I went ahead and I. I click on the link, I bring in some tickets, and if you just give Chris an email address, I will send a PDF of tickets to you. You don't have to click the link or anything, we'll just send you the tickets. Thank you. Okay, this is Kirk Miller, by the way. Hello, hello to everybody. How y'all doing? Hello, hello, hello. Oh, it's cold, but y'all ain't dead. Wake up. It's cold, but y'all ain't dead. Wake up. The earth is alive. Is the earth not alive? Is the earth alive? It's alive. All right, so y'all need to act like y'all alive up in this building. Come on now. Get with it. Yes, sir. Sure. Okay, I know we have time. Um, my name is Olinka Green, and um, I'm here to talk about the um, Ecological Devastation Tour that's been sponsored by Al Gore's Climate Leadership, Reality Corps, and also the Poor People's Campaign. And it's going to be said real quick, no, no, November 26, 2019, we're going to be Holy Cross Catholic Church, um, which is going to be located at 5949 Road, and we're going to be going to uh, some sites here in Dallas that have been impacted by uh, environmental pollution. One of them is Lane Clayton, which has been affected. Uh, uh, the ground soil and the water there has been uh, filled with uh, mercury lead, hexavalent chromate. Um, one of the other one is RSR lead smelter plant. We have a 52 passenger bus that we're going to be taking members from the community. We also kindly have been given uh, two. We're going to get uh, two 15 passenger buses to pick up other people. Um, we're going to be going to the lead smelter plant, RSR lead smelter plant in West Dallas. Uh, we're going to be going to Joppy, which has a situation with the uh, company batch plants. And then we're going to be going to Shingle Mountain, which y'all know about Ms. Marsha Jackson with the huge asbestos mountain in her backyard. But her, um, Dr. William Gardner from the Poor People's Campaign, I uh, spoke to one of the representatives today. They want us to go to Sand Branch. How many of y'all know about Sand Branch? Okay, so if you don't know about Sand Branch, it's a small incorporated uh, little uh, area right outside of Dallas that has not had running water in 60 years. And so the people basically depend on wells that they've dug. And so that's one of the issues that uh, Reverend Barber wants us to really look at. And so if you want to get on the bus, contact me at the back. I'll let y'all know. Um, and we really hope that y'all join and uh, get involved. And like they said to Rosa, to come and get on the bus. All right, thank y'all very much. Was that great? Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. We have, we have one more guest here, Marcus Russell, who 
is going to tell us about a nonprofit that he manages here. CIBM. How y'all doing this evening? I'm Marcus Russell, director of Commissaries Very Necessary, which is a nonprofit in the Highland Hills area and Stockton Perry area of Fort Worth. What we do, we provide resources, empowerment, and education for youth, children, and families who have relatives incarcerated or they are in juvenile detention centers. Uh, we have been working out of these areas for since probably about 2009. Uh, and we come into the Sierra Club. We do a lot of partnerships. This year, we partnership with Angel Tree to get 100 gifts for 100 kids in our area, uh, which is like the Lancaster, DeSoto, Oak Cliff, uh, Cedar Hill area. Uh, we also have community gardens in the apartments in Highland Hills. And we also have after school programs where the apartments have given us a apartment complex that we build schools and computer labs in there. And the kids come there after school. We have the feed program, tutoring program. We have kids gardening, and we're also partners, partnering with uh, Cedar Valley College. So we want C uh, the Sierra Club to partner with us and uh, help us do great things in the southern sector of Dallas. Right, we have a lot of time. I also have a, a presentation in May, which will be the full presentation. Okay. That will be our main, our, uh, our main program in May, right? Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, Ginger, membership committee chair, do you want to just mention that we have the calendars and the shirts? Sure. And whatever else you want to say. Hi, I'm Ginger Bradley, uh, membership chair for Dallas Sierra Park. Uh, we have uh, really nice shirts, the polos are $15 and the, and the green. T-shirts are, are 10, and uh, we've got all kinds of sizes. We've got the calendars this year for 12 bucks only. Super cheap, it's way below uh, list price. And uh, uh, you can also join the Sierra Club for $15 a year, which is really a good deal. And then you, you, can get, you get the magazine, and you get all kinds of notifications of fun stuff that we're doing, and I encourage that greatly. So thank you very much for everybody that came out tonight. Ginger. Uh, outings committee, Liz, Liz Whelan. I said I'm really Mark Stein, I'm tall and thin. Can't you tell? Mark's out of town, so I'm stepping in. Uh, I'm Liz, I'm one of our outings leaders and do the outreach program and a few things. So I want to first of all welcome everyone. Uh, our goal is always to get everyone to the outdoors in whatever way that is fun and comfortable for you. So in that regard, first of all, I want to thank everybody that came to our Beaver's Bend State Park Annual Fall Camp Out a couple weekends ago. We had, 46 people, we had 46 people. This is a gorgeous compound built by the CCC up in southeast Oklahoma. Um, just a lot of fun and camaraderie and fellowship for the weekend. Mark your calendars, third weekend of October, 2020. It's, we're set, we're in better reserve. Um, I want to announce it is almost full, possibly, but um, we're just still taking sign-ups for our next bus trip is to Big Bend National Park, the jewel of Texas. This is Wednesday, February 5th. We will be leaving in the evening, being on our bus overnight, and waking up at beautiful Big Bend. Um, you'll have three nights to camp or backpack, depending on which group you choose. And then we're changing the departure time for Sunday. So leaving in the late afternoon, we're leaving around noon, so you get back around midnight after a nice fun meal on the road. Um, but you'll be able to sleep in your own bed that night instead of on the bus all night to then go to work the next morning. Kind of draggy. So, a really great fun trip. We are offering a couple of options for base camping and just doing day hikes, and the other groups are gonna be doing backpacking. <coughs> Lots of fun. Um, I just encourage you, this is one of the true jewels of Texas. The signups, like I said, are already online. There's a document that just forms to fill out your payment. Send it in. We're near fall, and it's not till February, but it's one of those where we usually take a wait list. A few people will drop out, you can get in. 
So just look up all the information. Um, I'm one of the leaders and a few others that are here have been on the trip too. So we'd be happy to answer any questions you have. And to get ready for that, in Jan, the middle of January, we will be hosting our seasonal spring backpacking 101 class. This is for everybody and anyone who's just thinking about backpacking, um, maybe did it a many years ago and wants to refresh your skills, wants to just come and check out some of the tips on how to do it easier or better or cheaper. Our goal is not to sell you equipment like some of the other people that do the class in other places, but to give you the knowledge and the tips and the things that we've learned over the years to make it easier and cheaper and fun for you. Um, it'll be a lot of just great pointers. Um, and then we'll do a, a couple of like one night overnighters for the people in the class after that to get you ready and to kind of help you do your shakedown. So it's a great time. Um, I have a sign up sheet if you're interested. We're wavering between two dates, January 11 and January 18. The second date is the Martin Luther King weekend and I didn't know if that would make a difference for people is make it easier or make it harder because you'd be out of town on a three day weekend. So if you think if you're not committing to the class, but if you have a preference or you're thinking about it and would like to let me know what date would work better for you, that would be helpful and I'm going to sign up over here that. Thank you. Nothing for RCO right now. We're behind the scenes working on things. It's a little chilly for kids that don't really have many codes. Okay. Um, let's do David Griggs now. With He's our political committee chairman and he's got something to tell us briefly. <clears throat> Thank you, Dan, and thanks to all of you. Uh, yes, I am David Griggs. I'm the political chair for uh, the Dallas group and for the Lone Star chapter. Uh, I wanted to tell, say a couple of things to you. One, you probably know we've had an election last Tuesday and we endorsed, endorsed three of the constitutional amendments and all three of them passed. So thank you very much for your support on that. We have two, five, and eight, the two on the water uh, infrastructure and then the one on the uh, use of the sporting tax for uh, state parks and historical places. All of them passed. Thank you for your support on that. Another thing that is, thank you. Uh, he left. Uh, I wanted to pull up Turk Texas Green while we were talking. Can you do that real quick? TurkTexasGreen.org. It's on the website. Just show it as a background. Uh, always want to advertise. Uh, the uh, state political committee is raising funds for our political action committee for next year, starting for 2020. We have an event in Austin this weekend. Uh, you should happen to find yourself in Austin at 7 o'clock on uh, Saturday night at the Brutorium. Uh, we're going to have a party. Uh, we'll be doing that here in Dallas coming up in, in 2020. But we need to start raising our funds to help support green candidates uh, in 2020. We want to support some of the ones we did before, to keep them there, and we're going to get a few more folks uh, in there as well. So where you come in is this is the website. And you can go over here to the donate button. And at any time you want, for any credit card you have, if you would like to give us a donation uh, of $5 or $5,000 or anything in between, uh, we'd love to uh, have your support. Uh, that will go to our effort next time. So I just wanted you to kind of see how that works. TurnTexasGreen.org is the website. And look for the little tab that says donate. That's real simple. Uh, seriously. Even a small donation would be very much appreciated. The last thing I want to say is there is a chapter election coming up. Uh, you know, we have the group here of, of leaders. I think we're having an election too. Uh, the chapter election is contested. We have four people running for three spots, and we need you to vote. And, one, and of course, they're all great candidates. Uh, it'd be great if all four could win. Uh, but there is one candidate from Dallas, and you met him last month. His name is Brandon Morton. Uh, Brandon is the Sustainability uh, Director here at Burbank College. He's a good friend of mine, Wendell's, and several people in this room. He uh, normally comes to this meeting, and so I'm hoping that uh, you will support the Dallas candidate for the uh, Chapter XCOM. I uh, am one of the, the uh, current members of the Chapter XCOM. That means the Executive Committee, and essentially it's the Board of Directors of the State Sierra Club, Texas Sierra Club. So remember that when you get your ballot or 
get the card that tells you how to vote. It's an online vote. Uh, but remember the name Dallas, excuse me, Brandon Morton. And you, you can tell he is, uh, he is from the Dallas area. Just wanted to let you know about that. Please vote in that election. Thank you, Nancy. Thanks, David. Now we're going to go to our program co-chairs, Victoria Howard and Renee Robertson. Not and they will introduce, they will introduce our program for tonight. Thank you everyone. Again, lovely to see you all here. Um, I get I'm Victoria. I'm Renee Robertson. And before we introduce our lovely speaker, I just wanted to remind everyone to make sure that you're bringing your reusable cups to the meeting every month. Because when these plastic cups are on, we will not be replacing them, right? We're going to be walking our talk, no more plastic. We'll keep a couple extra things on hand for guests, but that will be it. Um, so keep that in mind. Also, please make sure that you come to the meeting next month. We're going to have Susan Alvarez here from the City of Dallas, who is going to give us an update on the Environmental Action and Climate Plan that's been going on. So it's a big <coughs> deal. We'd like to have a huge show for her, find out all the information, and get that going. So, no, excuse me, just as she said, come to that one because I've worked with Susan before. They do a lot of things with recycling as far as putting those recycle bins, and she helped me get uh, Girl Scout is working on her uh, gold medal, and I helped her with recycling, and the city stepped in and helped, and we got recycle bins put in the church and in the community. So they do a lot of things. They're kind of behind the scenes. Yes, so she's a wonderful resource, and we're so happy to have her here. But without further ado, we would like to introduce tonight's speaker, um, traveler extraordinaire, photographer extraordinaire, uh, Dan Lepel. Dan? <clears throat> so can everybody hear me? Doing okay. Well, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to come back and uh, speak with you again. It's it's quite an honor to uh, to be with you, and I appreciate you all coming out tonight. Such a cold night, and uh, but it's warm in here. So um, tonight we're going to talk about three trips that I've recently taken. Um, the first one is to uh, Mount Assiniboine in Canada, and then uh, I had the opportunity to go to China about a year ago for three weeks last December. And then the third area we'll talk about is an island called Svalbard, which is north of Norway. And uh, we'll get into each of those. <clears throat> so. Um, does, does anybody know where Mount Assiniboine is? Yeah. A few, yes, it's in Canada. Uh, it's in the Canadian Rockies, and it's one of the better, um, best kept secrets of the Rockies. So I'll point out, uh, this is Calgary over here. Easy to get a direct flight from the FW to Calgary. Um, and then you take Canadian Highway 1, and then this is Banff and Lake Louise, so you're probably all familiar with that. Calgary, Highway 1, up to Banff, and Lake Louise, and Mount Assiniboine is a little southwest of Banff. So Mount Assiniboine is right in this area here. <clears throat> there's, <clears throat> excuse me, there's two ways to get to Mount Assiniboine. Um, the first thing you do is get to Canmore and drive for about two hours on a dirt road to get close. And then, then you can either take a helicopter into the Mount Assiniboine Lodge um, and or campground, or you get, there's a day hike. It's about an eight hour hike uh, to get in into the uh, campground and you can go in either way. So being uh, lazy and getting older, I took the helicopter. <laughs> and um, the, the helicopter the, is more of a shuttle. And probably they had, uh, the day I went in, they had about 15 shuttles 
shuttle trips back and forth. It was about a 10 minute helicopter ride. And this is some of the, some of the views from the helicopter as you're, as you're going in um, from, from the, uh, of the Canadian Rockies. And this is right as we landed. This is actually a picture I took with my iPhone. And um, they, when you get there, they, they have a, a lodge and a bunch of cabins that are all run by the lodge. And when you book a night at either the cabins or the lodge, it includes all your meals. It includes guides if you want to use guides. And they have a tremendous hiking trail system um, in this area. This is Mount, oops. This is Mount Assiniboine right here. Okay, it, it's shaped a little bit like the Matterhorn from uh, Switzerland. In fact, uh, many people call Mount Assiniboine the Matterhorn of Canada. And I had the opportunity to be at the Matterhorn uh, literally about three weeks ago. And I was telling people the Matterhorn is really Mount Assiniboine of Switzerland. And um, many people had heard of it actually. They, they have sort of a similar distinctive shape. The, the lodge, as I was mentioning, includes, when you stay there, um, it includes all your meals, it includes guides that will take you on hikes. Uh, it is grizzly bear country, so we, we took in uh, bear spray and um, those kind of things. In fact, um, do you all know how to tell the difference between black bear scat and grizzly bear scat? Now, the, the grizzly bear scat has bear pepper spray and bear bells in it, is, is how you tell. <clears throat> so, so the lodge is open from maybe June uh, through September. The best time to go is the last two weeks of September. You have to sign up to go to the lodge at least a year in advance if wow. you want to stay in a cabin or at the lodge for those last two weeks, particularly of September. That's when the fall colors are, are beginning to bloom. And, and as you can see here, we were lucky to have uh, quite, quite a bunch of fall colors. <laughs> the, camp, the campground in this area is, is really nice. A lot of good pads for tents. And if you backpack in, it's easy to camp. A lot of people helicoptered in with their backpacks and camp, and then they were going to actually hike out. Um, one thing I should say too at the start, if you have questions, um, feel free to ask them as we're going along. I'll keep an eye on the time. If I'm going to answer it later in the presentation, I'll, I'll tell you, or I'll be glad to answer the question at the time. Okay. So this, this is the view from the front porch of the lodge. Um, has a great little lake down, down in the front. Um, it's probably a, a 30 to 40 minute uh, hike to get to the lake. This is, this is a picture of the lodge. Um, there's more of the lodge that goes off to the right of this picture. And so they have a lodge which maybe has, I'm going to guess, 10, 10 rooms in it with a really nice living room with a, a field stone fireplace. It's quite cozy. All the meals are taken there. And from what I saw, I probably saw at least 15 cabins that were also very close to the lodge here. So this, this is a panorama that was taken down at the lake. Um, and this is an image where probably 10 images were taken and I stitched them all together and trying to get a view of, of what this lake offered. We were down at the lake for about 30 minutes and we, we actually saw a, uh, a grizzly bear and a mother and a cub in this area. They weren't too interested in us and meandered off, so that was good. There, there's, as I mentioned, there's tons of hiking trails in this area. And um, this is just walking um, on one of the trails and we came across this tarn. Uh, it had maybe a third of the water in it that it can hold. 
And I wanted to talk about this image for a second because in, in the presentation, I want to talk a little bit about photography and if you're interested, how you can improve your photography. So what we're trying to do when we take pictures is take a three-dimensional uh, view and, and record it in a two-dimensional medium. So in order to give depth to the image, what we try to do is to include foreground elements close up that, that can give us a sense of the depth of the image. So in many of the images, you'll note that there's foreground elements included. In fact, I go out of my way to look for foreground elements that can be included in the images. The other thing I always do is when you're trying to get reflections, is if you get as low as possible, you'll get more of the reflection. If you were to take the photo just standing at normal height with the camera about four feet off the ground, you wouldn't see nearly the amount of the reflection. You might see the top of the mountains just a little bit, but you wouldn't see nearly as much as you see here. The other thing I'm trying to do, I'm making sure is on the reflection that the top of this mountain doesn't like intersect with that piece of grass. So I'm keeping the top of the mountain away from this piece of grass. This one touched a little bit, but there wasn't anything I could do about it. But you don't want to have major elements of the image merging together. Okay, so you want to keep the separation of, of the elements in the picture. <clears throat> so here, um, again, we were very, very lucky on the weather. We, we actually, I actually went into the Canadian Rockies about two weeks before I took the helicopter into Mount Assiniboine and I was at uh, Banff and Lake Louise and Moraine Lake and then drove the Icefields Parkway up to Jasper, towards Jasper and things. And of the two weeks I was there before going into Mount Assiniboine, it either snowed or rained about, of the 14 days, 12 of the days. And it was wonderful on one hand because having snow in the Canadian Rockies, fresh snow in September is really rare. But on the other hand, um, it can make difficult seeing the mountains. Many of the mountains aren't out. The, the morning we left Canmore to get to the helicopter pad for the flight in, it was raining. And uh, by the time we got to Assiniboine, this is what we saw. So we spent the, we, we landed about one o'clock and because the weather forecast was for rain literally all day there, we, we ran around like crazy the entire day trying, trying to see as much as we could during the nice weather. And you'll see in some of the images, the weather changed two or three times in the three days we were there. <clears throat> so this picture, um, over here is the lake that you can see from the front of the lodge. This lake here is the one you see from the front of the lodge. And the lodge itself is way, is way back over this way, looking down towards this lake. You don't see these two lakes at all from the lodge. So the lodge is way over here, and you don't see these two lakes from the lodge. So this is a viewpoint that we hiked up to. It's probably an elevation gain of maybe a thousand feet is all, so it wasn't a big deal. But it was a bit strenuous because it was uh, mostly straight up, no switchbacks. And we came up here for sunset and got a good view of Mount Assiniboine and the surrounding area. Of course, these large trees that are the yellow pine trees um, really helped with the fall colors. Very fortunate with that. This is another picture of the sunset. Um, and zooming in more on the two lakes that you can't see from the lodge. This was the next morning. Uh, we went to one of the tarns, and here for the foreground I was using some ice that had formed on the edge of the tarn to use as my foreground element. <clears throat> So this is on the hike from the lodge down to the main lake. And this, compositionally, what's important about this image is the use of what we call a leading line. 
if you can get a leading line coming into the image that leads the viewer's eye towards the subject, which in this case is the mountains around, is Mount Assiniboine itself and the lake and things like that, uh, makes the image much stronger compositionally. And it just leads the viewer's eye right in. So um, if, if you, when you're taking photos, if you can find a leading line, or if you can find something in the foreground to, to make large, to give depth to the image. And the, the third thing that you have, if you can remember, is don't put the main subject dead bullseye center of the image. It tends to be a little more interesting if it's off to the right or left. In fact, we have this thing called rule of thirds, where we divide um, like a tic-tac-toe across the image, a tic-tac-toe little game piece. And if you can put the major subject points where those lines cross, you get a stronger image. So if you can remember those three aspects of composition, your, your photos will become much more interesting to look at and much more powerful compositionally. And you'll see lots of, advantage, lots of examples of those as we, as we go forward. That, yeah, the question is, what kind of camera and lenses am I using? Um, I, used to, I used to shoot Canon full frame type, type camera systems. And about five years ago, I switched to a camera system called Micro Four Thirds, which is a much smaller physical camera with much smaller lenses. The camera bodies are about half to a third the size of like a regular Canon and the lenses are about half to a third of the size. And so uh, on the Micro Four Thirds system, they offer a lens that is the equivalent of a 24 millimeter to a 200 millimeter zoom lens. And that's one lens. So I use that lens for literally 95% of the images I take. And so everything you've seen so far was taken with that with the exception of the iPhone shot that I pointed out, was taken with that 24 millimeter to 200 millimeter lens. 24 is pretty wide angle. Um, our eyes typically see like we're looking through maybe a 50 millimeter lens. So if you think a 50 millimeter lens would be what you normally see when you look at something, 24 millimeter is going to take in about twice as much as what you normally would look at. And then a 200 millimeter lens would be about a 4x magnification. So, so this picture here was probably taken with maybe uh, about a 50 millimeter lens. So the blue sky images you saw were the, that afternoon. And then the next morning, um, we had some pretty good clear sky. And then the second night we were there, it snowed which was great. And, and when we woke up the next morning, this is what we found. It was just fantastic. And this is around September 25th or so, I'm going to guess. And they're, get, they're going to close on October 1st. <clears throat> so we, we took, took another hike south, uh, actually walked for about four hours on the trail that we would have hiked in had we not taken the helicopter. And this is one of the views. This, this is another one. Um, a little bit later that same day, the, some of the snow had melted off the rocks. Now, now this image compositionally um, has the large foreground objects. Uh, the lichen on the rocks really adds a lot of interest I, and color. And then the rocks themselves form a leading line leading up to the subject. And, and the subject is in the top third of the image. So we, I've sort of included all three of those things that I mentioned. Uh, large foreground object, a leading line to lead the viewer's eye in, and then the main subject, which is that mountain, is not dead center. So it's in the, in the upper part. Does that make sense? <clears throat> So now we're getting towards sunset, and we found another tarn um, outside of the Assiniboine direct area, but we're on this trail 
that you would see if you were hiking in. And um, so here are some of the uh, cabins. And one of my favorite times to photograph is when there's either a storm coming in or a storm is clearing. So this is the kind of light you get when you get a clearing storm. And so if you see the light on the larches coming in there and you can see how the clouds are, some of them are opening up, the sky is getting dark, parts of the sky are really dark, parts of the sky are really light. And that's one of the, sort of my favorite time to photograph. So this is, one of, this is one of the little two lakes we could see from that high viewpoint. Can't see this lake from the lodge. It's about a one hour hike from the lodge. Beautiful reflection. Uh, and, and I purposefully put this log, this little branch. I actually carried it with me. I found it on the trail <laughs> and um, maybe 100 yards away from the lake. And I brought it with me thinking this if I can't find a rock or something in the lake, I'll use this as my foreground object. And it, with the way the reflection worked, it worked really good to put it in that little V and not have it intersecting with any parts of the cloud. You don't you keep them separate again. So no part of this is intersecting with the cloud. And so that, that was sort of a foreground I created. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, good question. The question is, are you using polarizing filters? The, those are filters that screw onto the front of the lens, and they're like your polarizing sunglasses that will make, make the sky bluer. Um, on this one, I am, yes. Um, it, the, sometimes, the, depending upon where the sun is, a polarizing filter will help enhance the reflection in the water. And actually, it did it. Uh, for this one here to bring out those clouds a little bit more in the water. Some, sometimes it can kill the reflection also, depending upon where the sun is. Yes. So, um, question was, am I using a tripod for these shots? And if, if you're shooting with a regular uh, camera, you would want to use a tripod because in order to focus, to get this in, this in focus and that mountain in focus, you have to shoot at a very, very small opening in the lens, which means the lens is letting in little, little light. So the, the shutter speed is very long, usually, to take these kind of shots. Now, one, so with a normal camera system, you would be using a tripod because this is probably a, a two or three second exposure. Now, one of the major benefits of the Micro Four Thirds camera system that I'm fortunate to use is it has image stabilization that's built into the camera sensor itself and the lens, and they talk to each other. And the image stabilization buys me about seven stops of handheld. So I can hand hold literally a two second exposure and have it be crystal clear. So in this case, I'm not using a tripod because I'm sort of getting really low. The camera is actually sitting on the shore, on the grass, I'm so low. And if I had used a tripod, I couldn't get that low. Um, but my friend who went with me, who shoots with a Canon, he had to use a tripod to get the shot. Statement? Hmm? Statement back here, hello? Yes. Um, that reminds me of a Botticelli painting. Just oh. beautiful. Oh, thank you. Yes, the reflection is quite stunning. Eh? Yes. And I was extremely disappointed that Mount Assiniboine wasn't out because Mount Assiniboine is right there. <laughs> and so just, you know, this, this could have been an even better picture had Mount Assiniboine. That's but, beautiful by itself. That's well, thank you. Awesome. Um, and the key there is if Mount Assiniboine had been out, probably would not have had those clouds, in which case wouldn't have had this reflection. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's six of one, half a dozen of another. Thank you. <clears throat> so here, on the last day, the clouds are coming and going, and the mountain is playing hide and seek, right? 
pokes out a little bit, don't see quite the whole thing. And again, um, photographically, I'm using a leading line to, to lead the viewer into the mountain and have a large foreground object. So here's the leading line come through with this river with this large foreground object kind of thing and the fall colors um, adding, adding a lot of interest. So we um, had to, then we helicoptered out on the fourth day after three nights and, and they, run this, they run these helicopter trips like clockwork, it's amazing. Um, they, the first two trips took all the luggages down and then people started going and there were about 12 shuttles. Um, I was on like shuttle number three and the, my friend who went with me was on like shuttle number eight or something like that and then we got to the parking lot and started our, we had about a two and a half to three hour drive back to Calgary at this point to catch our, catch our flight home. But this, is, this is a view from the helicopter on the way out. Uh, not quite as clear sky as we had on the way in, but I like these two different lakes with the different uh, colors. Okay, let's, let's jump over to China. Um, I had the opportunity to go to uh, China last December for three weeks. And, and pretty much do nothing but photography. And, and this is just, this is about eight or nine miles outside of uh, Beijing. This is the Emperor's Summer Palace. It was built in the 1800s, as I recall. And so again, compositionally, photographically, we have the leading line, uh, leading the eye over to the island. We have the something close up to give the image depth and the main part of the subject, which is this bridge here, is not dead center. <coughs> then, then we went to the Great Wall, and um, we went to a, a part of the Great Wall that was called the Jin Shanling area. It's about 125 kilometers northeast of Beijing. And what was really unique about this part of the Great Wall is do you see many people there, right? There's no people. Um, usually there's pictures of the Great Wall that have so many people in them, you can't see the Great Wall pretty much. And um, this, this area, there was a brand new hotel. We were some of the first guests that stayed there and there were no crowds. We were very fortunate. So again, compositionally, large foreground object. Large foreground object here to give the image depth. And then, of course, the leading lines going up. And I should comment about the time of day, this golden light that you're seeing on particularly the higher pieces of the wall is, is a sunrise kind of time frame. I love sunrises. There's very few people around. It's very peaceful. It's very serene. Um, from our hotel, we could walk to the Great Wall. It was all, oddly enough, it was all uphill. Um, so it was quite strenuous to get there, but once we got there, it was uh, a lot of fun. Another thing you can do compositionally is use some of the elements for framing of the image, and that's what we've done here, <coughs> is uh, frame the various pieces. And <clears throat> so here we're shooting out of one, one of the windows, and uh, you can see again the morning golden light, and you get the same golden light uh, just before sunset. And the, that's called the golden hours, either the first hour after sunrise or the last hour before sunset. <clears throat> Again, compositionally, um, we're trying, I'm trying to do a number of things here. Got the, got the framing of that, big, of that big building. We've got the leading line leading into the image. We've got the main subject off center. So those three main things I've talked about are all happening in this image. Now this is um, going into central China. This is the Li River and, uh, in the Gian province. And has anybody heard the story of the Comorant fishermen? Yes. Yeah, a couple? Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll give a, a short version of it. Um, 
This fishing technique dates back to around 800, the year 800, so maybe 1,200 years ago. And it's, it's the, the fishermen and the comrade birds work together to capture fish. And it was used a lot in China, used a lot in Japan, and some other parts of, of Asia. And the, the, the fishermen would go out at night and have his lantern on, and the light from the lantern would attract the fish. And the fishermen are on bamboo rafts, tons of bamboo in this area. And once the fish got close to the, um, to the raft, the comrades, which naturally dive into the water and feed on fish, the comrades would dive into the water and, and grab the fish in their mouth and swallow them. Now the fisherman has put on their necks, down towards where the neck connects to the body, has put like a metal ring. So there's an, that metal ring constricts the neck such that the birds, the comrades, cannot fully swallow the fish. They can capture the fish, they can swallow them into their neck, they can get maybe two or three in there, depending on the size of the fish, and then they are trained to come back to the raft where the fisherman takes the birds and dumps the fish out into his basket. So these, these men used to be fishermen, but now they make more money modeling for photographers. And so they really don't fish anymore to, to earn their living. They're, they are carrying on the, the culture and the tradition, but they, they earn their living by modeling for for us photographers that are there to capture the tradition. <clears throat> and the mountains in the background are the, um, let me just check my notes here. Those are the karst mountains in, in the background. <clears throat> and so we would, we had two or three mornings in this area and, and you'll see a number of different images of these uh, comrade fishermen. This is one of the main reasons I went on this trip, was to be able to experience this. We would go out, uh, probably, we would leave the hotel about four in the morning, and the sunrise would come up about six, and we'd meet the fishermen about an hour before sunrise, and get to the spot that we wanted to shoot, that it had the nice background and things like that, that we thought would create a good, a good photo for us. This fellow was deaf and couldn't hear any of our directions at all. And uh, finally, uh, we, we had a local guide that spoke Chinese, and he actually had to get into the water and position the raft at some point because this fellow couldn't really hear anything. <clears throat> and I think that might be his son um, next door there. So after the morning shoot uh, with the comrade fishermen, we went into one of the local markets in Guillen. And uh, it's always fun to go to a local market because you really get to learn a lot about the culture. Here you'll see, you know, in this fresh meat area, you don't see a lot of refrigeration. Um, everything is sort of wide open. Great, pla great place to see the kids and and see things going on here, some older fellows, I think they're playing gin rummy maybe or something, like that. but they're slamming the cards down and just talking and having a great time. Good. I don't think they even knew I was there taking, taking their photo. <clears throat> Fellow here doing some painting. When you see something like this, it's a good idea to really zoom in um, and get some of the details of what's happening and things. And this is the advantage of my 24 to 200 millimeter lens. Other people, the fellow that went with me, he's changing his lens and, and everything, and I just sort of zoomed in, and took the picture, and was ready to go on to the next one. He hadn't even changed lenses yet. <clears throat> so this, this is sunset then, the, our first night, and and it's always great to, to use backlighting where, the, where you're shooting into the sun. So there's a couple of things going on here with, with the fisherman throwing the net, with it coming into the light. Uh, you only get this effect if the light is directly in front of the camera and behind his net. The other thing is the starburst on, on the sun. Keep hitting the wrong, 
you know, the starburst right there is everybody asks, well, how do you get the starburst? Because when I look at my camera, it doesn't do starbursts. So what you do is put your lens to a very small opening in camera terminology being f16 or f22. And so it's like a very small pinpoint opening letting in light. Again, then you have to have a really slow shutter speed. But when it's that small of an opening, the, the blades that are on the aperture of the lens that open up for more light to come in or close down for less light, those blades are actually what's creating that starburst. So if you shoot, if your camera can shoot manual, and most cameras can these days, but nobody uses it, they all use automatic. But if you can set your f-stop to f16, f22, sometimes even f11, you can create the starburst. <clears throat> Part of their um, ancient garb is this, this cloak of uh, sort of feathers and grasses and things like that. That's to keep rain off. <clears throat> this is the next morning at sunrise at a different part of the Lee River. And um, the fellow doing, doing the same kind of thing. We were very lucky in that the wind died and we were able to get reflections. Um, if the wind's up, we wouldn't have gotten any of these reflections. <clears throat> and, and even if the fishermen aren't there, the karst mountains with the, the river leading into them and some of the skies looks fairly painterly uh, at, around sunrise time. Then we went in uh, over to the ocean side um, the Lee River with those fishermen was interior. The, the ocean side, um, these are the ancient uh, fish farming areas. And uh, we had another fellow there that had the um, ancient uh, clothing that he modeled for us as well around the fish pens where they were growing, the, farming the, uh, the fish. Then we went to the Yellow Mountains. Uh, these mountains are central China. We took a maglev train ride there, bullet train, like 300 kilometers per hour on the train, super smooth, really nice. China's making a lot of investments in their infrastructure right now. We saw maglev trains being built, constructed, the tracks all over the country. It's just amazing. <coughs> These mountains are about, as I said, 2,000 meters high. They have about six um, hotels up in the mountains. So we took a gondola up to the mountains, and then we hiked for an hour with our luggage to get to the uh, lodge that we were staying at. And we stayed for uh, three nights up there. And the, mo the first morning, we woke up to this, to another wonderful snowfall. <clears throat> and it was foggy, sort of ethereal, very serene, very quiet. By staying up on the mountain, we, we literally had our area of the mountain around our lodge to ourselves because the gondola rides didn't start till like 9 or 10 in the morning. So it was maybe 11 before any tourists got up there. So we could go about anywhere. Um, and th this, this tree here had the frost on it and just some light was just coming into it. And uh, I was very fortunate to find this. And if it's a gray, cloudy day and you can't see the mountains too much, then you look for people, uh, interesting looking people that are willing to pose for you. And uh, she was one of them. And now there, behind this um, tree is just a whole panorama of mountains but it's foggy, and fog is one of my favorite times to take photographs. Fog is the great simplifier. So th this tree, you wouldn't even notice it if the fog wasn't there because you'd see all, you'd be looking at all the mountains behind it. Something like this is what you would see behind it. So the next morning, the snow stayed, the clouds cleared, and we, and we got a bit of a sunrise. 
And again, the, the starburst is created with the f-stop set to the right position. And now then the sun is beginning to backlight some of the trees. And I really like this morning glow, golden light coming in on the snow-covered trees. Very peaceful, again, very serene, very quiet. <clears throat> and since we're above the clouds, now the clouds are getting backlit. You can see the fog down in the valley. And many of these pictures were taken on with a tripod because the light level was so low, the exposure is probably five to six seconds in, in order to uh, be able to capture the light. This is as the sun got a little bit higher. <clears throat> the snow. Some of the mountains. So the, here's another photo, photography compositional element, and that's using the tops of this tree here to sort of frame uh, the rest of the mountains. So it, it's just a framing technique to use. Now, the, the tree branch is coming down from the top. That tree, I'm standing under that tree to take the picture, and I've purposely placed myself so that those branches are coming in right there. And I'm trying to make sure that the branches aren't merging with the major subject, which is that mountain peak on the left. And one of the, one of the trees on the side of the hill. <laughs> this is a panoramic shot of probably eight to 10 images that were stitched together. Try to capture uh, some of the, the grandeur <clears throat> there was a lot of construction going on up on top of the mountain, and everything for the construction was brought up by these guys climbing the trails, um, probably up a good um, 2,000 feet to come up. Wow. Again, using the tree to frame. So I wanted to talk about this guy. So the on the left, those are... Uh, roofing shingle packages. And my guess is, at least in the States, each one of those packages would weigh about 40 or 50 pounds. So, so my guess is there's 150 pounds on each side. And when he was walking, he would take a step and sort of shift a little bit, and then take another step and shift a little bit. And, and if you think this guy is walk is climbing stairs up 2,000 feet, can you imagine? I mean, just the strength. And, and every, you know, he's making as many trips per day as he can make, up and down. Just some. The final part of China that we went to was the Yunyang uh, rice terraces in the southern part of the country. And, um, this again is clearing storm, kind of light shooting into the sun, backlit clouds, and the reflections coming down onto the rice terraces. So again, the fog is a great simplifier. You don't see all the detail um, things behind it. Zeroing in a little bit to the light. Just there's no filters or anything. This is the way the natural light looked. And then as the, as the sky cleared a little bit, we had the fog down low. <clears throat> and I just love the patterns here and some of the, how the things begin to peek out of the fog and just, and the fog is coming up. These rice terraces are different colors um, due to algae in, in, in each terrace, a little bit different. Here's another lady with her her basket, heavily, heavily loaded. You notice here, this tells the story. The guy in the background is sort of the foreman, and he's rolling up the grasses into these huge piles. And then the ladies sort of stoop down, and he puts them on their back, and the ladies carry them away. Here's a, this is a, a sunset over the rice terraces. And then our final day, this was the sunrise over the rice terraces. Just very uh, great experience, opportunity with the red from the sun reflecting in the, 
the water of the terraces. And then finally, after the terraces, we went to another local market. Uh, if, if you get an opportunity in a foreign country to go to a local market, it's a great experience. And of course, you know, playing with, uh, playing with phones is a global experience, of course. This family of four on the motorcycle, I, I've seen as many as seven people on one of these. Didn't get the picture, uh, but this shows you the idea. This fella is smoking a huge pipe. It must be six inches in diameter and maybe four, four feet long. It's a water pipe, I'm told. And in, these, in the markets, you can get anything done. This is a dentist working on this lady. He's just right out there on the street in the market. She's being held by two of her sons getting a tooth pulled. Okay, final part. I've got about seven Ma'am, minutes. Yes, question. Were there any restrictions put on what you could, pictures you could take? Yeah, the question, question is, were there any restrictions put on any pictures we could take? None at all. Now, when we were in Beijing and Shanghai, and we were going into the places with the armed guards, I didn't take a lot of pictures. Um, so I, maybe I didn't test, test the boundaries too, too much, but where we were out in the country, no, no restrictions at all. Mm -hmm. They were, some of those were, I converted them to black and white because the colors weren't too interesting and the black and white sort of brought out the mood a little better. I should have pointed that out. Okay, the final place we'll talk about here in about the last 10 minutes is an island called Svalbard. Um, the North Pole is right about here. So the North Pole is right about here. Svalbard's about six, 700 miles south of the North Pole. Um, it has about 2,300 people that live on the island from 53 different countries. It's also the home of the Global Seed Bank. I don't know if you've heard of that. They have a million species of seeds that they claim covers over 13,000 years of agricultural history as being protected in the uh, seed bank. Um, we, I asked if we could go see it, and they said, no, you can't get close to it. It's in an old mine, and there's not much to see, I guess. So, um, But this is Iceland down here. So Iceland is way far south of Svalbard. Svalbard's at 78 degrees north, and um, you know another 12 degrees north, and you're at the North Pole. Yes? Um, question is, why did I, why in the world would anybody want to go to Svalbard? And um, you'll see in a minute. But it's, um, it's there's 20, 2,300 people on Svalbard. There's 3,500 polar bears on Svalbard. It's where they spend their summers. And, and we were very lucky. This, this is just, I took this trip in June, just this year. And the sea ice this year, was amazingly solid and large. And the sea ice came within about five miles of the island, all the way down to the island. And the sea ice is where the polar bears hunt the seals for their, for their summer and winter feeding and things. And, and the landscape around Svalbard is amazing. Svalbard itself is 60% of it's covered with glaciers. 13% of it's covered with vegetation, and the, rest, the last 27% is barren rock. So we'll go through these quickly. <clears throat> so this is Longyearbyen, which is the largest city, the northernmost city in the world. Um, it's, it's at 78 degrees 13 minutes north. Yeah, the, the question is, what countries does Svalbard belong to? Up until the EU was created, it was owned by a consortium of countries, much like Antarctica is governed today, where it's like 13 or 15 countries that shared parts of Svalbard. About 20 years ago, Svalbard became associated with Norway. And so now Norway owns it, but it's not part of the EU. Uh, so when, 
even though Norway's part of the EU, Svalbard wanted to keep as much independence as possible. So it's outside of the EU, but it's under Norway governance right now. And that's how you get 2,300 people from 53 different countries. Statement. Mm hmm Question. So me, Donald Trump can't buy it, right? Uh, that's right. It's <laughs> definitely not for sale. Thank you. Um, t tons of mines, were, lots of mining things. In fact, we'll see that in just a minute. Um, this was the ship I was on. Very fortunate, there were 12 photographers on the ship, a French ship with a French chef. And it was, it was a great 11 days. We lived on the ship for 11 days. And um, this is, we, we met in Long Yerbian and then we went north. We got as far north as 80 degrees north. And we would run into walruses. Um, this is taken from a zodiac, so I'm eye level with the walrus. The, the, the only thing I can, what this picture brings to my mind is the incredible smell. <laughs> Which was not real pleasant. But there must have been 15 walruses in this area. <laughs> this guy was really relaxing. And what's cool here is we're in the zodiac, so I'm pretty much at water level, so I'm even below eye level, which makes it a lot better composition for the, for the wildlife. This is one of our zodiacs as we go up to check out one of the 60% glaciers. Question? So how cold was it there? Yeah, how, the question is how cold was it? This is in early June. The, the sea ice is just melted or just begun to melt. And quite honestly, it was very pleasant, maybe down to the 30s at night and the high 40s, low 50s during the day, even though we're only 500 miles from the North Pole. <clears throat> yes? Got a question. Yeah, question, yes. Um, how did you go there? Uh, by that tour operator? Or? Um, yeah, the question is how did I get there? I, I was on a photo tour. Um, we flew into Oslo, and then we all got on a plane and flew from Oslo a, about a two and a half hour flight up to Long European, which is on, on the island. So th this was a photo tour specifically targeted to photograph polar bears and the landscape. <coughs> it was based in the US, yeah, yeah. And my card is here on the table if you'd like to see more photos on my website. <laughs> and if you have any questions about any of the travels or anything you see on my website, feel free to email me and I'll be glad to share how I got there, who I, who I traveled with, those kind of things. So I talked about, I like to photograph the edge of the weather, and this is a great example of the edge of the storm. Um, this weather was coming into us, and uh, it got real dark after, in about 10 minutes after I took this photo. This, this is one of our bearded, bearded seals, which is the, the, the filet mignon food for the polar bear. Um, they, polar bears love the, that's why the polar bears are up here, because these guys are here. <clears throat> this was taken from the Zodiac. I was just literally about three feet away. <clears throat> Super nice folks. So this is what the, this is about as dark as it got in June. The sun really never went below the horizon. We were so far north. And this is sort of twilight. So this is how the sea ice looks so from the North Pole. And we, this was our first polar bear we spotted. And we saw him about a mile away. <clears throat> with the binoculars, and we were extremely lucky because he, he saw our ship and became curious. Now, now these images are taken with an 800 millimeter lens, which on my camera system is about 10 inches long. On a big camera system, on a Canon, that would be about a 18 or 20 inch long lens, but they have a bigger sensor, and so my cameras are smaller. So this guy became curious about us and started coming towards the ship. We spent two hours with this polar bear. We were very, very lucky. <clears throat> and he, he played around a lot. He just, he got within about 50 yards of our ship and then made a hard, right, hard, 
hard left and walked across. He didn't come right up to us. Wow. But, then he, but then he stopped and just put his paws out, sort of looking at us. He went for a swim. There he is, Stan. We, we decided this guy's probably about a teenager, as polar bears go. He's not a fully grown adult yet. But then he, he crouched down looking at us. And this is my favorite image. He, I, I wanted to, before the trip, I said I'd really like to get a leaping polar bear. Wow. And everybody said, yeah, right. You know, there's one of those per year, maybe. Wow. And, uh, but I was very lucky and got a leaping polar bear. This is one of my favorite images because behind him, you can see some of the light coming through the glacier, actually. Yeah. And so you've got that light blue and you've got all the ice around, the sea ice. <clears throat> so this is back on the ship. This is up on the bridge. This is um, how we spotted things. In the bridge, one of our guides has binoculars out. 20, someone's there looking for wildlife 24 hours a day. On, on the upper deck, they have a spotting scope. This third so right there, spotting scope. And then on the front of the deck are some of our people, pretty much 24 hours a day. So we got three levels of people always looking for either walruses, polar bears, bearded seals, whatever we could see. We saw a blue whale, mm. largest living mammal on Earth. Mm. Um, it was just amazing. <laughs> Lots of glaciers, and I took this because of the different textures, the softness of the clouds, the hardness of the rock, and then the, the texture of the glacier itself, similar type of reason. <clears throat> so we needed a foreground object, so we talked the guide into lowering one of the zodiacs and going out there to be our foreground object. <laughs> When you go on a photo tour, you can do that. If, if we'd been on a regular cruise ship, that wouldn't have happened, of course. So we, we, once a day, we tried to go on land and hike. So on this one here, we had hiked up about maybe 1,000 feet to get higher, and we, these reindeer came up to us. And from this bay, we could see four glaciers coming into the ocean. This is one of our guides. Anytime we're on land, uh, we had to have armed guards in case uh, polar bears came after us. Polar bears are pretty much the, at least I've been told, polar bears are the only bears that will stalk and attack a human. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, grizzlies don't stalk and attack. Um, if you run away from a grizzly, you trigger uh, a, a in, in built-in response within the grizzly where he thinks you're food and he will chase you, but that's only if you're stupid enough to turn and run, uh, whereas polar bears will, will stalk and attack. So um, we had SEAL Team 6 with us all the time. Did you know? uh, Pretty much no, <laughs> not on the polar bears. <laughs> this is a calving glacier, this piece right here used to be as tall, an entire chunk. So this piece here used to be way up here, and it just fell straight down. And you can see the wave that's beginning now. It's about a four-foot wave coming towards the boat. <clears throat> More polar bears we saw on land. So we saw other ships. Um, the, the ship in the foreground would dump, would drop down probably 15 zodiacs and they would all chase the bear. We had two zodiacs on our ship that we could get in. We tried to stay away from the 15 zodiac play, uh, boats. So this one, again, compositionally, we have a leading line with the water, sort of leaning, leading the eye up to the walrus. That's why it was shot this way. <laughs> more reflections and things. These are from the zodiacs. This polar bear is from the zodiac. So now I'm, the previous bear, we were up on the ship. So shooting down. This one, I'm in the zodiac shooting up. If any time you can get below eye level and you're shooting wildlife, photographing wildlife, it's a little bit more powerful image. You can see how big his paw is. <clears throat>
There's the ship with some more walruses around it. This was a baby bearded seal. Really cute. Mom was out fishing, looking for food. Like the mood of this with the glacier and the light. Wow. This one here, I took it because of the light, the dark sky, the white snow. <clears throat> this is our ship's captain. He went on a hike while we were on shore photographing some uh, birds and things. Just beautiful country. This is one night after dinner. We ate dinner in, in a fjord, very calm, and the captain says, okay, you all might want to go to bed now because we're going to have like 20 foot seas. So everybody went to bed except me. I went up to the bridge and was photographing the waves crashing over the bow of the boat. <clears throat> and that's what's happening here. This is, on the final day, we ran into a group of beluga whales, about 40 beluga whales that were eating on the edge of this ice. And then there were actually, we had the beluga whales and a polar bear was wandering around also looking for seals. There's the polar bear on the front of the ice, in front of the glacier. Final thing is we went to one of the abandoned Russian mining towns from the, from the 50s. <clears throat> Did they mine there? They mined coal in this one. There were some other uranium deposits and things but the, in Svalbard, but mostly coal. Not, not active at this point. The reindeer are pretty much taking over. There's one of the cell phones from the 60s, a Russian cell phone. <laughs> Final day, beautiful reflection, and that's it. Right. <laughs> okay, then, um, any questions? Any further questions? Yes. Is it also known as Spitsbergen? Uh, Spitsbergen is the largest island of the Svalbard chain, yes. And Longyearbyen, the city we, met, we left from, is on the island of Spitsbergen. Yeah. Another question, yes? Did you, uh, how populated is it around here? Around Svalbard? <laughs> uh, is it livable or, or maybe villages? Uh, the the uh, Longyearbyen is the village, is the main village on Svalbard. And like, like I mentioned, um, there's 13% vegetation coverage. So there's, so around Year, Longyearbyen, there were, you could see some fields, but no agriculture. So everything has to be brought in. <coughs> yes? Did anyone in Svalbard talk about how uh, warmer temperatures have affected the area at all? Um, that was a, actually, the question is, did anybody comment about the global warming and its impact on Svalbard? And there, there were comments about the permafrost is, is not as perma as they thought it, thought it was. And that was a major concern on our tour actually, because we were going up there, hopefully to see the polar bears on the sea ice. And last year, there was no sea ice. Uh, they, the sea ice was so far away from the island, they couldn't get to it. So the only, photo, the only polar bears they could find were the ones that had gone onto the island. So that was a major concern. And we were very pleased and lucky that the sea ice was so much this year. So there, there was a lot of discussion about the impact global warming is having on Svalbard. And it's sort of the last, you know, it's so far north that it's, it's seeing some of the early global warming things quite, quite easily now. And that was a major part of discussion. Other questions? Dan? Yes? Uh, two things. One is, for festivals, we have new people here tonight. We love it when you come. Your beautiful photos remind us why we are in Seattle. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we love it when you come. They give us that reminder. But all of you, you know, without Sierra Club and other groups like us, you know, these places will be lost forever. They will be, yes. And, and we appreciate the new people. But my last question, you've been coming for years, is is your goal to spend your last dollar on your last trip? It is. <laughs> I, I actually, true story, um, I've been very fortunate. I've been retired for 20 years. And 20 years ago, before I retired, I bought a book called 
how to die broke. And, and I told, I have two sons, and I told them, I showed them the book, and I said the last, the last thing is, the last dollar will be hopefully spent on a flight home from someplace really cool. But that, that is the goal. And my wife is fully supportive of that, so far, so, which helps a lot. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Dan. Um, there's a lot of food back there. What do you want to do with that food, you know? Eat it, whoever we have plenty. We don't like to take it home, we don't like the waste. Okay, you can either eat it or you can take some home. That's about all we can do for you. Okay? And with that, do we have anything else we need to say? Or should we? 101. Uh, Arthur doesn't want to do 101. Okay? So let's go drink then. <laughs> oh, one last thing, one last thing before we adjourn. We're having our holiday party on December 15th at El Phoenix. And uh, I guess everybody that's here would be welcome. Which El Phoenix? El Phoenix, which El Phoenix? Pasolina. Butler at Garland. Butler at Garland. Garland, 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 Garland. Buckner at Garland. Okay, that's it. The meeting is adjourned.